This is a production of Cornell University. So my title today is uh, Messages from a Maverick. Uh, model micro, and um, what, what I've realized it is how much I really do enjoy plant pathology. Uh, this morning I was grateful that I had the opportunity to think about this seminar and lecturing today in the, instead of other things, and I was uh, really grateful for that. Um, obviously, the model microbe is Phytophthora infestans, and we know. Oh, I wanted to say also this photo, which I've seen many, 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 many. Ever, without ever any attribution, was from Vaughn James uh, from my lab about 30, 35 years ago. Um, we know that Phytophthora infestans is a model microbe because Selkie and Camus and a 31 and his very closest friends have said so. <laughs> and they said so in, in this publication. Um, in sage advice, Alan, I don't think so. Uh, that's not what I can do. And I'll just tell you some of the reasons why I, I cannot. Um, first of all, uh, uh, I'm an introvert. And for those of you who are introverts, who's an introvert? Yeah, OK. So we don't give advice so easily. Uh, it's really hard. Uh, have you heard the, the famous story, joke about introverts? You haven't? Which one is it? When, how do you? Uh Tell a Finnish extrovert from a Finnish introvert. The uh, Finnish uh, extrovert looks at your shoes instead of his. Yes. <laughs> Absolutely correct. <laughs> so um, I'll be talking like this. <laughs> oh, when I was, and also, um, you know, my career um, time um, really did not have a special plan. It, it just sort of happened. And so I, I have to say, I have had no special career goals. Um, so there's nothing that I can say that would provide any career goals to anybody. Um, but what I have wanted to do is be a professor in a, a small university. Uh, I got the professor part right, but I've never quite made the small university. And um, like I think some of you, um, my first years in graduate school were, were sort of tough. Uh, I wasn't sure that I should have been in plant pathology. And it was interesting to, to go through that experience. Um, and I, th I suspect that I'm not alone in that. And I think that um, no, that's OK. I, I have subsequently come to just absolutely uh, really enjoy the subject. It's, I find it just really, really exciting and, and really a lot of fun. So I have messages from five top three infestants in three categories. And since I'm not giving advice, what I'm going to do is sort of relate some things that I've learned um, during the last several years. Um, in these categories, first of all, epidemiology and population genetics of Phytophthora infestans. Um, a short segment on humanity. And a short section on host pathogen interactions, where I think I'm going to illustrate sort of the maverick qualities of this um, organism. But I need to provide some context for all of this. And this is me as a diligent graduate student um, some years ago. And you're probably all thinking that um, I'm sleeping, but I'm thinking very hard uh, at this point. <laughs> Notice also that I do have brown hair at this point. Um, you're probably thinking that maybe I was thinking about um, Phytophthora infestans. But actually, that's not true. Um, when I was in graduate school, I was essentially a lab rat. I went to the greenhouse once a year, and I never got to the field. Um, and my thesis actually was really very interesting. I discovered a new uh, enzyme that um, was typical of pathogens of cyanogenic plants. Some plants produce a cyanogenic glycoside. They give rise to HCN upon infection. HCN is really quite toxic. And, um, but it turns out that many pathogens of these plants produce an enzyme that converts hydrocyanide to formaldehyde. And I was really, I was really proud of that accomplishment. Um, but, I, but there's another message here um, 
in this one, and that is <coughs> that your audience really matters. It turns out the audience for cyanogenic work in plants is really small, as illustrated here. My first phytopathology paper on HCN, that must be 1981. <laughs> <No>. Okay. <laughs> uh, cyanide tolerance and stem low tide. <laughs> Since 1971, it's had 15 um, citations. My first paper on phytophthora and festans was 1975, <coughs> and 79 publications, which is interesting, and three or four in the last six months, which is also interesting. The most impressive paper, um, certainly with HCN that I published, was in Archives of Biochemistry and Biophysics, and it's had 90 uh, citations. Again, nothing in the past or four months. Uh, my most highly cited paper on phytophthora and festans is this one in 1994, where we described a pan global distribution of a single clonal lineage in PNAS with 437 citations and 20 in the last seven months, which is interesting. So the message here, you know, there was no audience for my really excellent work in cyanogenesis, but there was an audience uh, for work on phytophthora and festans. And I have to say, this paper, you know, I never, I thought it was sort of demonstration of the obvious. Um, and yet it was, it, was, um, it was picked up by, by a fair number of uh, readers. Okay, so I was hired, and um, saw this picture before, I was hired to uh, teach disease control and do appropriate research. And with my background in plant physiology and biochemistry, that seemed like a stretch. Uh, and it was. I really didn't know what in the world I would be uh, going to do. So um, I thought long and hard about it, and <coughs> it started, um, that, that uh, position was actually here. And what I decided to do was to focus on um, late blood for a variety of reasons. Um, first of all, it was a model for epidemiology and control to use it that way. Secondly, it was important in New York State. Um, and it was possible to, to do field experiments. <coughs> and there was expertise in the department. I want to credit Dave, <coughs> excuse me. I want to credit Dave Thurston, who was remarkably generous with uh, advice and help um, during the early stages. And uh, he had been working with Phytophthora and Festus for really quite some time. I thought he was old at that time. Um, but he was really very helpful. So that was the reason I chose it. All right, um, some epidemiology and population genetics um, studies. Uh, when I first started work at Secret, Secret, I would really have to do some field experiments in epidemiology and management. Uh, my first uh, field experiment occurred in 1972. It was a total bust. We got drowned out from Hurricane Agnes. My second field experiment was of a Glitterman later in the same year. There was absolutely no disease. And I realized that you know, this is um, not the easiest pathogen in the world to work with. Um, subsequently, I moved to um, Freeville and did learn how to do uh, field experiments with Phytophthora and Festans. This is an aerial photo of those plots, uh, and um, it's a false color infrared photo. And the healthy tissue looks bright red, disease tissue gray, or in soil is sort of gray. Um, so there were really significant differences in these. And, it was really actually fun and interesting to do these kinds of experiments because um, they were almost analogous to doing enzyme assays in a test tube. How many people have ever done enzyme assays in a test tube? A couple of us old folks, right? <laughs> we don't do that anymore. But um, I did, and uh, the kinetics were very interesting. <coughs> and disease development in one of these plots had uh, kinetics that weren't being used. And it was really interesting to see disease over time and kinetics were really quite important. So what we knew uh, about the epidemiology of Phytophthora and Festans was really quite a lot. And Jack Brune in 1981 published a paper describing a simulation model. A cartoon of it is listed here. And we knew enough to put this together and it could be reasonably accurate, which was uh, a really interesting accomplishment. Of course, to run this model took hours and hours. Uh, actually, the first time we did it was on punch card, which was the mainframe. 
Um, but we used to do experiments over the weekend. We'd come back and we'd have a simulation experiment. To do the same experiment today takes less than a second. Um, and Jorge Andrada um, refined the model in 2005 and illustrated that it really works pretty well. Um, in these various uh, epidemics, the observations are in the open circles and the prediction is in the straight uh, continuous line. And you can see that the prediction fits the observation pretty nicely in most of these. And that model has been the basis for a decision support system that uh, we've subsequently uh, produced here. This, uh, this paper by Ian Small from last year, um, in which we named and used the Blight Pro Decision Support System. And that's really kind of cool. Um, it involves host resistance, uh, past weather, future weather, fungicide, a pathogen strain and pathogen proximity, all together in helping growers make management decisions. And what's really important, I think, is that all this is done in essentially real time. So it's, it's a, I think it's a very nice um, tool. What we didn't know at that time was what caused unexpected disease control failures. And we wondered about uh, whether the diversity in the pathogen population might contribute to that. And so we began a, a question um, looking at population genetics of phytophthora infestans. And when we started, this is what was known. Uh, we knew that there were A2 and A1 many types in Mexico. Phytophthora infestans is heterothallic. So there are two many types, A1 and A2. And only A1 mating types have been found from the rest of the world. So two people coming to the lab where we really had wonderful tools. Paul Tooley brought Alizon to the lab, followed by Steve Goodwin, who developed here um, RFLP fingerprint for uh, DNA fingerprinting of isolates. Prior to this time, the only markers that were available were mating type and morphology. And there was no diversity in morphology, so we only had mating type essentially a single marker. And that was, you just couldn't tell anything about populations of plant pathogens from that. Um, these, um, these tools gave, gave us this um, possibility of looking at population structure of this organism in other locations. And so we so, um, requested isolates from people around the world. Some were from uh, culture collections. And um, analyzed those isolates using um, both markers developed by Paul Tooley and markers developed by Steve Goodwin. Um, in Mexico, what we learned is that indeed the A1 and A2 mating types were present in about equal uh, proportions. When we applied uh, Steve's DNA fingerprinting to these, what we learned is that the population was very diverse. And what this slide illustrates, these, these numbers real estate, um, illustrate individual um, individuals. The DNA is in this lane, just with the restriction fragment with uh, restriction enzyme, and then probed with RT57. And what you'll see is that these individual strains are really quite different from each other, which um, is consistent with this being a sexual um, population in central Mexico. What we learned from everywhere else was something really dramatically different. And so the ISOs from the US, Canada, Peru, Ecuador, Colombia, the UK, Netherlands, Poland, Japan, Taiwan, Philippines, Kenya, Uganda, and Rwanda all had the same thing, which was um, a really interesting observation. We termed this um, clonal lineage the US one clonal lineage, because we saw it first in the US and then saw it everywhere else. It's all A1 mating type and one type of mi uh, mitochondrial DNA. Uh, the allosomes were 100 and all had the same DNA fingerprint. And that's what was uh, produced in this um, paper I'll talk about the pan global distribution of a single um, lineage of phytophthora infestans. How can you explain that kind of situation? Um, nobody can explain it for sure, but one possibility is that this organism went through a severe bottleneck uh, and went somehow to Northwest Europe. In Northwest Europe, there's a very um, vibrant seed potato trade where seed potatoes are sold all over the world. 
to South America, Africa, Asia. And this organism goes very happily in unexpected sea tubers. Um, another possibility is that, that it came first to the United States, and in fact, maybe like appeared in the United States before it appeared in Europe, and then maybe from the United States it went to Europe, and then su subsequently was distributed throughout the rest of the world. So those are um, some possibilities. Well, we've continued collecting isolates from people around the world, and um, so Linda Spielman made a really interesting discovery. Um, she said, look, there's something else happening in these uh, locations around the world. And so, um, sure enough, there was. Uh, and what we suggested is that there was a second worldwide migration and population this is some of the most exciting work that I've ever been associated with. And probably is some of the most important. I wrote a spectacular proposal to investigate this and it was trashed. Um, which is really interesting. Some of the, it seems like some of the most important and most interesting um, projects just don't make it. So the, the, um, the reviewers really didn't like it. Um, and they, they, they didn't believe that this could be happening. But in fact it did. <coughs> Um, it made the news in um, the early 1990s. Um, there was an article from um, the New York Times. And this is what actually happened. In the 1970s, US-1 was distributed essentially all around the world. By 1997, those populations had been replaced. You can't find it in most locations. You can't find that particular venue. It's been replaced by a different population of Phytophthora infestans, which is highly diverse in most locations. And actually, there's sexual reproduction occurring in, um, in the Scandinavian countries. And we do know how that happened. There was a shipment of potatoes from uh, Mexico after the 1976 season, because in Europe there had been a drought in 1976. There was a very short potato crop. And Europeans decided to allow Mexican potatoes into Europe so that, that they would be used exclusively for consumption. Um, you can't prevent people who buy potatoes in the store from planting them. And I'm sure that's what happened. And that's what brought in these um, novel strains of phytophthora testing. And then they were subsequently distributed around the world with that very vibrant uh, sea potato trade from, um, from Northwest Europe. And it happened really fast. Um, we didn't have isolates um, in the Netherlands, Germany, and Poland. We could uh, collect that in <coughs> times. And we could demonstrate that this, the, there was this introduction of these new strains, and they displaced um, the old strains that had been there. And so this message I get is that with this organism, migration and population displacement are really huge. Um, and it didn't happen only in Europe, it also happened in the States. Here's an example that was particularly um, impressive to me. Um, and this concerned a lineage that we've called the US-8 clonal lineage. Uh, we detected it in 1992 in Costa Rica, New York, at the uh, end of the season. At the end of the season, we had a sample from Maine, which also had that particular strain. And we have seen this straight before because we've sampled from Northwest Mexico and found this exact same uh, isolate and present in Northwest Mexico. And then in 1994, it covered the entire eastern part of the U.S. And by 1995, it had colonized all of the western part of the U.S. So one of the things that we've done is to look at the population structure over time, and this slide prepared by Giovanna Donis illustrates that US-8 was the dominant strain from 1997 to 2008. It was replaced in 2009 by US-22, and I'll say just a little bit more about that. And then you can see that uh, after 2010, that US-23 has become the dominant strain. And this turns out to be really typical for Phytophthora infestans is that there are these waves of predominance and disappearance. Um, and it's, not, it's true not only in 
the US, but also uh, in Europe. And these are data from David Cook, who illustrates that the um, US one strains present in 1982 were gone by 1995. Um, and then these A1 strains were present until about 2005. And starting in 2005, there was dominance by this strain here, which is called blue 13 or 13A2. And that particular strain is also very aggressive and um, has become dominant. So the take home message concerning epidemiology and population genetics to me is that all non-Mexicans, Mexican Phytophthora infestans populations are recently derived from elsewhere. You know, this organism just um, goes in lots of places. I've seen um, reports where people have suggested that we have an Irish strain of Phytophthora infestan. What they don't say is it's only been there for 10 years, and prior to that it was in Mexico, uh, which is strange. There's no way that there's such a thing as an Irish strain. There's no way that there's such a thing as a U.S. as a U.S. strain. They're all recently derived from Mexico. Um, okay. So, my next topic is about humanity. Now, I took this picture in early August, 1994, uh, and this is a potato farm. And this is a potato field. And it's brown because it was destroyed by lake light. And this is a sprayer right here. And that grower had been sprayed two or three times a week to um, suppress lake light. So I talked with the grower. This is always difficult to say. about what he did. And he said, every Thursday night, the growers in this county get together and they cry together. And that's because they were unaccustomed to the fact that this strain would be just a little axle. and dramatically more aggressive. They just were unaccustomed to it. So that was sort of my first introduction to the damage and the human impact that this disease and pathogen could have. This is a picture of Byron Chapman. He was a grower um, in Madison County. And in 1994, he lost his crop. These are data he sent illustrating what Lake Blight did to him in 1994. In 1995, he declared bankruptcy. And a couple of years later, he died. Nine of similar story happened. It was really fascinating. Uh, Kevin Myers in my lab took this picture uh, at our local Lowe's. He took this picture on June 23rd. These are tomato transplants to be sold to local gardeners. And they are infected with phytophthora infestans. And what happened was, what it happened not only in our Lowe's, but in New Jersey, in Pennsylvania, in Connecticut, in Maine, all throughout the Northeast. In, in the third week in June. And I visited this organic farm, um, I think, toward the end of July in um, 2009. And this was the last planting of tomatoes, and they were being destroyed by Lake Blight as well. And I received this letter, which I think, well, I'll just read it. I am an organic gardener in Amsterdam, New York, with 63 heirloom tomato plants of 23 different varieties. They're all gone. I was growing very rare varieties, blacks, greens, oranges, whites, all purchased from a very reputable grower in Skoharie. Tonight I had to leave home as my husband and pulling and begging all 63 plants. I have 100% loss. We live on 10 acres. 
I inspected every day, and it seems the blight took my plants in a matter of hours, which obviously didn't. Um, I was hoping to sell them for additional income. So um, this, um, as I chose late blight to work on as an academic decision, just because I think it was a convenient system to use. I've heard about all of this in the Irish potato famine and all. But to experience it was really, uh, really quite uh, significant. And this site was given to me by uh, Sanjoy Gula Roy. It was an example of a 2014 late <coughs> epidemic in West Bengal in India. And what happened there was that in 2013 there was significant overproduction that led to low prices and some growers could not uh, get their loans repaid. In 2014 there was a devastating late blight epidemic caused by P13, the one we saw um, in Europe. Uh, there were terrible losses, uh, economic and social, and farmer suicides. And then uh, Santo is particularly disappointed that the government, uh, or he is, uh, limited exports to uh, other places because that sort of destroyed the future markets for the growers of uh, our fields. So my lesson that I've taken from this one is that late line is a deep Okay, next on to host pathogen interactions is my third topic for uh, message. And I've labeled this one uh, the Fry Lab failures. And this, they're failures because um, we've been unable to see phenotypes that other folks have seen. Uh, the first one concerns um, PR5 osmotin, which according to the PNAS article conferred resistance to late <coughs> So we received, the, the developers of this were happy to send us transgenic potatoes that were expressing PR5. We put them in the field. This is an experiment where we had different um, potato genotypes. And unfortunately, the plants with PR5 were not at all resistant, just completely not. So that's, we, you know, we just could not achieve the same result that um, the folks at Purdue had achieved. And then a, a year or two later, uh, I was in conversation, email conversation with a colleague in Europe, and she said, I've created resistance to late blight. And I said, wow, that's great. Uh, and then she was working the company. And uh, they were going to create transgenic potatoes that were resistant to late blight. And unfortunately, we were able to do a field test which um, would confirm that experiment. Um, and this is a picture of that field experiment. Uh, there's some people in the room who were part of that experiment and remember it well. Um, and by this time, I'd learned how to kill plants with late blight. And although the company would never come across or were convinced that what happened, the construct had a pathogen-specific promoter, uh, with an R gene and an AVR gene, so that upon uh, inoculation of uh, the leaf with phytophthora and festans, you get a hypersensitive response and uh, effect resistance. And I think that's what they saw um, in their experiments in Europe. Um, so this is uh, just after we had inoculated, and this is what we saw um, after the epidemic had progressed. Turns out there was indeed diversity. Uh, in the transgenics, some were more resistant, some were less. There was nothing associated with the trans. We could associate nothing. It just there was diversity. So uh, one of the things I really learned from this is that if you put potatoes through a callus, you reduce a lot of some hormonal variation, and that explains uh, some of the diversity that people see. Um, the question is why? Why do some people see these? Um, these phenotypes that we can. And I've wondered that for some years, and then just in the last couple of years, I think, I think I actually know. And I think the answer is that sporangia from a culture are not the same as sporangia from lesions on the face. And people inoculate in the growth chamber with sporangia that come from culture. An epidemic in the field, there's not an old variety that come from culture. They all come from leaflets somewhere. So, <clears throat> the reason I, I think I know this 
uh, comes part, in part with work from <coughs> Eduardo Mizuguti. Um, Eduardo was, his, his approach was to, um, or his goal was to look at how sensitive Phytophthora and Festus Sporangia are to solar radiation. And you, he had a terrible time. He was one unhappy graduate student um, for the summer because every time he did this experiment, you, know, you take the sprangia from culture, you expose them to sunlight, and there was just absolutely no survival. Finally, in desperation, when he didn't have a culture available, he took some sporangia from a leaf. And lo and behold, they did survive. You know, on, on cloudy conditions, they can survive for hours. <clears throat> Under sunny conditions, which is illustrated here, most of them are dead within 60 minutes, but they survive you know, 10 or 15 minutes in, in solar radiation. So clearly, <coughs> these sporangia from this culture, are, which don't survive at all, sporangia from the leaf do survive, they're really different from each other. The work with Dan Klesek, we had another insight into this. Um, Dan was working on arachidonic acid, uh, and where he demonstrated that, in fact, if you treat plants with arachidonic acid, they become more resistant to phytophthora and pestans, which is, which is great. And here's an image of that. Um, here is a leaflet um, that did not have arachidonic acid applied to it, and you can see a nice lesion. Here's a leaflet that did have arachidonic acid, and the, um, it was a very small lesion with almost no circulation. Well, we tried to repeat that experiment, and we didn't get the same thing. And then I realized the reason we didn't get that phenotype is that we were taking our sporangia from leaflets and inoculating. So if you take a sporangium from a leaflet and you put it onto plants treated, either treat, not treated with arachidonic acid or treated with arachidonic acid, um, you get no phenotype. Again, it's the exact same pathogen. One comes from a leaf, the other comes from culture. So one of the questions that uh, Sean Patif was asking is, is there an effect of this pathogenicity? And uh, he did a field experiment in which he took sporangia from a culture, two different isolates, and inoculated plants in the field and plant, uh, leaflets in a moisture. <laughs> and you can see that um, he did get disease, uh, different amounts of disease from the two isolates. If he took sporangia from a leaflet, um, both in the field plots, and for, for both isolates, he got a lot more disease with the same number of sporangia than he did um, if the isolates came from culture. And that's particularly true with the uh, disease on leaflets in the, um, in, the, um, in, the, in the moist chamber. So our goal is to try to understand what, um, what is happening, and one approach is to use um, RNAC to determine, first of all, if the sporangia are different from each other, and secondly, to see what's happening during the infection process. Uh, those materials are still a while. They're going to come back. Uh, we don't have them yet. So in lieu of having the RNA-seq data, uh, Sean did some um, quantitative real-time PCR. And what we know is that infant which is an illicit from phytophthora infestans. Uh, that's a protein that if you put it into tobacco, it creates a hypersensitive response. Um, we know that that, um, excuse me, the, the uh, elicitin is downregulated in, in, um, in planta. Uh, there is an RXLR, that we, which is an effector from phytophthora infestans. From previous studies, we knew that one to be upregulated in, um, in tissue. And so what we, what we did was to compare the expression of these two uh, genes in sporangia that came from either leaves or from culture. And what we found was that from culture, inf1, which causes hypersensitivity, was upregulated. The RXLR, which is an effector, uh, was downregulated. So what Sean did was to look at the ratio of inf1, or the expression of inf1 to the expression of RXLR uh, between sporangia that came from culture or sporangia that came from leaflets. And what he found is that for these two isolates, 
there's about a, a more than a 50-fold difference in expression of those two genes. And I suspect that that difference in expression can cause a uh, different phenotype if you're using a strand from culture versus a strand. Okay. So the pathogen clearly is different. What about the host that, that is in, if, in different environments? And it turns out, I think, that the host also is different depending on if it's grown inside or outside. Uh, we did this experiment. Chris, we did 2000. Yeah, it was last year. Last year, right. <laughs> 2001 or 2002 or 2003, something like that. And Chris was heavily involved in this one. We were looking at the differences in resistance between two um, uh, closely related uh, tomato uh, introgressions. Uh, we did find a QTL for resistance. And what was remarkable about this um, is that, first of all, we could, we could get fairly good um, gene expression without a whole lot of noise, which was really interesting. We used um, Microtom, which is old technology now. But one of the most interesting to me discoveries uh, for plants that were not inoculated, but just growing together, what we found was that the top 34 of the top 200 most variable genes were all defense related. And <clears throat> what I'm wondering is, are they in fact defense related or are they just are, are they just perturbation related? They're just growing in the field, they're, they're exposed to all kinds of things. And the top six included catalase, which was the first one, and then five PR genes, which were the most um, variable strains, uh, variable genes in this experiment. Uh, we also found uh, significant differential expression of, of genes in the two different, um, two different uh, genotypes of plants. And we found that uh, we were able to silence two of about 32 that were upregulated in IL-62, but not uh, in M82. M82 is the more susceptible. And when we silenced those two, it reduced the resistance in IL-62. The conclusion that I come to is that field expressions of Field studies of gene expression are entirely possible, and there's not a huge amount of variance. You don't have to have a you don't mess, you don't always get a huge amount of variance with those. Uh, and I'm just going to suggest that if we really are interested in post parasite interaction that's happening in sort of new field, that it's a whole lot more efficient to do this kind of experiment in the field than it is in the field. So the third message I have concerning host parasite pathogen interactions is that maybe, at least for Phytophthora intestines and its host, the um, interaction it can be specific to the environment. The experiment is done. So finally, um, the three messages to me are there's no such thing except in central Mexico of a native isolate of Phytophthora intestines. Late blight can be absolutely brutal, and the results we get with it can be specific to the environment. Now, this is a maverick microbe. One of my good friends, Cindy McNabb, um, developed this limerick. This is kind of cool. Uh, Phytophthora infestans is freaky, prototypical, also quite sneaky. Its maverick ways cause eyebrows to raise and theories turn porous and leaky. Sometimes it textbook quintessential, exemplary, so elemental. That's when it conforms to microbial norms, a model that's quite providential. Sometimes it's eccentric and weird. A renegade has reappeared. It starts breaking rules, making us look like fools. Conclusive results disappear. This model that's, this microbe that's model and maverick, exemplary and enigmatic, we must understand, learned by us both, and eccentric, yet paradigmatic. So I'd like to thank you and also to uh, recognize this group of people with whom I work. Um, I don't have pictures of everybody um, that I've worked with for, for this time, but I would like to, at least uh, Chris is in the audience now. Um, is Hillary there? <laughs> um, oh, and Bar my wife Barbara is here. So she works in the lab and has been uh, a good partner. So I think with that I'll just...
quick. And if there are any questions, I'd be happy to uh, try to address them. Um, so you found that things like sporangia or host plant resistance are variable in greenhouse versus uh, field. But what about in your modeling? Was it more than those parameters estimated from greenhouse experiments? Um, th that's, I think the, actually the model does need to be recalibrated. What we've learned is that different isolates have different parameters. Um, I think most models were constructed on, on the U.S. Long lineage. Um, the applicability of those models um, is, is really not known at this point uh, to, you know, how, how useful they are. I think what we saw was sort of a qualitative difference in terms of um, in terms of the field versus the uh, greenhouse type of interaction. But this model has been tested uh, exclusively, in the, or not exclusively, but a lot in the field. So I think that, that has helped us a lot. Yeah. So your take home message number one is that all the isolates that we know of today came from Mexico. And if they're all moving about, and we're getting these new epidemics with new <coughs> genotypes. Presumably, you get different mating types that move about, and then you could get geographically specific isolates, right? When do you think that's? You think it's already happening? Yeah, it's happening. There, there's um, there's a sexual population in Scandinavian countries and probably Poland, uh, Estonia, Latvia, uh, Western Russia, um, and whether that will develop into something dramatically different or not, I don't know. Uh, in many places, it's still highly clone. Dramatically clone, just like it is in the United States. Uh, I think all of Africa is that way. I think India, Asia are that way. Um, South America is that way. Uh, so there's, there's, it's, it, it's a mixture actually. Uh, we do, there is sexual reproduction in that part of uh, the world, with, uh, including the Scandinavian countries. But most other locations have. Um, clonal lineages, and sometimes they have the same one, like this blue 13, uh, which is dominant in Europe, is now dominant in China and in India. So just as a follow-up to that, so for places where the populations are clonal, uh, quarantine issues seem to be key. You're not going to get a diverse population there unless you, unless you allow entry of new isolates, right? Right. But this pathogen travels on potatoes around the world and it travels in the air around the world as well. So I think there will be, there is migration um, quite, quite dominantly. Yeah. How will these new moving arrivals sexual uh, lines in Mexico, how do they interact with potatoes uh, in Mexico? Do you see epidemics or is this more of a balanced system? No, I'm, it, in production, uh, well, potatoes were not grown commercially in potatoes until the 1950s. Prior to that time, it was it was on wild species. Uh, but now, uh, there's a hell of a lot of fungicide used on commercial potatoes in uh, Mexico in various locations. So, um, spent a little in the Chuluca Valley in Central Mexico. It doesn't because there's such a diverse population. It doesn't uh, to look at any single individual. But elsewhere, for example, USA, we saw in uh, the Los Mochis area, the Sino Lola State, which is causing tremendous problems there. Any? So I'm curious about the transgenic AVRR gene uh, potatoes that you saw kind of go down. Did that look like a typical disease, or did you see signs of autoimmunity or uh, any kind of visual? It looked really typical late life. The, I, the, I, we thought there was no phenotype associated with that. This is so cool. So what is it? What is up with the future? So Jonathan, I was on the stage with Jonathan Jones one time. He was saying that the R genes are going to be the very best thing since sliced bread. And I got up before that and said they're never going to work. Um, <laughs> so what, what was what's really cool is that if you combine the effect of an R gene with a fungicide, that will make the R gene a lot more durable. And Simplot company is doing that. You know, they have transgenic plants with R genes. 
They want those plants to be, uh, receive a little fungicide because, as Michael Milgram has demonstrated, if you suppress selection, then you delay um, the demise of a particular origin. And one way to do that is to use a small amount of fungicide in addition. So I think, I think it's going to be integrated management, and I, I think that's what's going to happen. Elders in Geneva have a question? They probably say no. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, we don't have. <laughs> Anybody else here? Well, Bill, we. Oh, please go ahead. Yeah. So I'm confused about the role. No. Um, so, sexual recombination creates new genotypes, and mutation is the source of, of those of that diversity. So, we know that um, phytophthora changes a lot. Um, for example, in a single lineage, there can be a whole bunch of diversity for effectors that are recognized by. Um, but what we do see is, is you do get tremendous more genotypic diversity in a sexual population than in an asexual population. But we have highly clonal populations in most of the world. Well, Bill, we want to recognize you and thank you again for a really outstanding informative seminar. has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.